It's wonderful to be here. And I want to thank you for showing up on a Saturday morning, no less, which is really commendable. So <clears throat> thank you for being here. I want to thank Janet and Walt Seeley for all their efforts in organizing uh, this whole kind of initiative uh, in the Lander area. I want to thank Doug for hosting us here at uh, the Lander Art Center. Actually, I, we have some history here. And Caravan had an exhibition at the old Lander Art Center just down the street in 2016. And that's when I met Melissa Strickler, who's been of great help to us as well in organizing all this. So thank you so very much. This whole event is one of the associated programs that's related to this exhibition that we have at the Fremont uh, County Pioneer Museum titled Abraham Out of One Mini. Many of you were there last night for the opening. If you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to go back, uh, to go and see it. If you've been there, go back again and really study those pieces and look at them. Uh, that exhibition originated out of really what we noticed in the West and especially in North America, this rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim sentiment, especially over the last four or five years. And, uh, and Wyoming, by the way, was not excluded in that. And uh, in fact, and you look at one on, on, among the uh, different states as to kind of high anti-Middle Eastern, high anti-Arab sentiment, we rank one of the highest in our state. And so it felt really apropos that we bring this exhibition here. Now, so what we did is we focused on artistically looking at what we hold in common and what surfaced very clearly is that Christians, Muslims, and Jews have this unique figure, Abraham, uh, in common. And they all trace their heritage back to him. And so in looking at his life, we discovered very uniquely this ancient figure that comes from southern Iraq had a tremendous amount to teach us about embracing the other, whomever the other is, and welcoming the stranger. Two huge themes that were needed within the West at this time. And as we kind of started looking at Abraham's story, it became clear that all could benefit from the principles of his life uh, and of his spouse's lives, Hagar and Sarah, in turn, learning how to live harmoniously together. And so whether one is religious or whatever ethnicity one comes from or being non-religious, it doesn't matter culturally, et cetera, regardless of the diversity, there's these wonderful principles from which we can learn about living together harmoniously. So that's what that exhibition is about. We invited three celebrated artists to participate in it, and they were commissioned to create work for it. And our criteria was threefold. One is they had to, be, had to be known of a certain level and of renown, especially coming from the Middle East. That was one. The second is their styles had to flow seamlessly so that here, because if it's very disparate, it's gonna throw the theme of the exhibition. And so they had to flow seamlessly together. And so we selected artists that we felt their work, albeit different, would work together in a joint uh, exhibition. And then the third thing, and that's the most profound and most important thing, is that they as artists embody the spirit of this exhibition in welcoming the stranger and embracing the other. And in that regard, we have the privilege of having with us one of those artists who was with us for the opening last night, Kaysel Cindy. And he'll be sharing. And the title, of course, is The Power of Art to Bridge Differences. He has lived this with his life, starting in Iraq and then in Jordan and then in, around the world in many ways where he's exhibited. Uh, Case has participated in a number of our caravan exhibitions that have been around the world, Paris, all throughout Europe and all around the United States and the Middle East. And so in the context of all of that, more than anything else, he's not just a well-known artist and a great artist, he's a good friend. And so I'm honored to have you here. Thank you. Very much so. And uh, about Case a little bit, he grew up in Baghdad. He has degrees in engineering and in fine arts, Baghdad University and the Academy of Fine Arts there. 
Uh, he did his thesis on ancient Christian art, largely frescoes that are found in churches throughout Iraq. And at that time, it was not long after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So he's got stories to tell as he's trying to get to this particular church in this part of Iraq. And he's got to go through all U.S. soldiers to get there in his own country in many ways. He ended up uh, moving to Jordan for a while and taught there and then came to the United States. And he now lives in San Diego. Uh, he has exhibited, and one thing that's unique about his art is that there's always a purpose to his art behind it. It's not decorative, though it can be, of course, in one's home, but there's a deeper dimension to his work, and it carries this large humanitarian peace-building uh, uh, spirit throughout it. I could talk a lot about Case, but we're here to hear Case, so welcome, Case. <laughs> Uh, when Paul uh, suggested uh, this title for my talk today, The Power of Art to, to Build uh, Bridges to Bridge Differences, he awakened one of the stories who kept slept in the coma of my mind. So it was like a story of a friend of mine in the College of Fine Art. I forgot that story like a long time ago. I had a friend, a classmate, in the College of Fine Art. And she told me once when we were in uh, the first grade that when she was 15 years old, a lot of her friends or like, let's say neighbors, bothered her by throwing stone at her window. She was blonde, beautiful, with freckles on her face. She was different and she was talented. She was artist. And those like teenagers, boys, used to always throw stones at her window. And you know, she was, uh, let's say, very peaceful, and she couldn't like do the same to them. She talked to her parents that your kids are like bothering me, annoying me, teasing me, fighting me by throwing these stones at me. And this is very dangerous and very, something very serious. And they kept doing the same. And then she ended with a very good solution. She collected these stones. And since she is an artist, she started to paint on these stones, you know, color them and paint <clears throat> character and symbols on them. And collected these stones and called her naughty, naughty neighbors and gave them back these stones. <laughs> and in such way, she was able to gain good friendship with them. And I forgot this story, like, absolutely, it was a long time ago. But, you know, Paul, like, awakened this story. I, I believe that all of us have, like, all of us have a lot of stories and, like, slept in our memory. And it's good to have them, like, uh, up again. Wall or a bridge? I believe, like, some people will always throw stones on your path, as I said, like, in this story. And it depends on you what you make with them wall or bridge. Remember that you are the architect of your life. Here, this bridge is in north of Iraq. It's made of bricks and it's one of the uh, like the main bridges in Zaho. It's a governorate in north of Iraq. I believe also we can do a lot of things with these bricks, you know. We can build wall, a bridge, building, we can start a war with them. We can do everything with them. It depends on you what you want to do with these bricks. Here in the College of Fine Art, my tragedy, if I may say that, started when I was in the College of Fine Art. Here I'm doing a mural of Picasso and his, his Jornica here. I started studying art in 1996. I graduated from, I got my bachelor degree in 2000 and then my uh, master of fine art in 2004. When I was studying the master of fine art, at that time, the, the war erupted. Iraq was invaded in 2003. After the war, as a consequence of the war, a lot of extremist people appeared in Iraq and they started to fight each other because they, their fight based on their denominational affiliation. They started to fight each other. 
we, me as a Christian, as a minority ethnicity in Iran, we were a target for those extremists. Plus, as an artist, I was a target for the extremists. This is one of many murals I painted in Iraq. And this is in uh, the College of Fine Art. And this I remember was um, uh, a project of uh, environmental art, I think in the fourth grade. Those extremists seized that art depicting or imaging the figures is something against the will of God. This is based on their belief. What they did, they destroyed all the sculptures in my college. They destroyed and demolished all the statues. They see that these statues are like a pagan. You know? They see us as a paganism. They destroyed all of them. And also they erased and demolished the majority of the murals. Mine was one of them. They kept this one because the dean at that time like fought for to keep this one. But the other ones, I have like ballet dancers. I have uh, women's in my murals, the main character that I love to paint. And all of them were erased because they see it's like a taboo, like haram based on their mentality. <laughs> That's why I felt that my life was in a serious threat. I have to leave. I'm Christian. I don't like, by the way, to say like to like to say that I'm Christian. You know, I am a human before that. But I'm Christian. I am a good believer. But I don't announce that. I don't when I go like to the college, wherever I go, I don't say, "Hey, I'm Christian." I don't do that. <laughs> but they know that I'm Christian. And because I am, plus I'm an artist, I think those two main reasons were like a serious threat to my life. I have to get my luggage and leave. I use, I get this luggage, like I'm like a family of, like I have a family member like of five. When we traveled to the States, immigrated to the States, we got 10 luggage. Each one has like two luggage. These luggages, I exhibited them in many, many exhibitions. I feel that what we put inside these luggage is not our clothes or our belongings. We put inside them our dreams, our homeland, and the country that we left back. Because these luggage traveled a lot, they became, you know, very old. You feel that they traveled a lot. And you can see the traces of the airports, um, you know, traces of the longer trips that they like experienced. Here, another story of a friend of mine, his name is Mamdouh. Mamdouh, he was a specialist in painting portrait. After I left Iraq, he stayed in Iraq. And by an accident, he was like close to a bombed car, a booby-trapped car. That booby-trapped car exploded in Karada. The Karada is where my studio was, my gallery was, exactly like around maybe across the street. I was not there. I was lucky, thanks God. But Mamdouh was there. He was attacked like accidentally by this by this accident, and he was injured. And they took them, him to the hospital, and he stayed in the hospital for one week. And after that, he died suffering from his injuries. I wanted to document this incident to express how the war, the violence, the sectarian tension in Iraq lead to this catastrophe lead to this, if I may say, like genocide or massacres, you know, which is everywhere. I painted my friend as a portrait here, his portrait, because he was a portrait. He, he, he painted portrait. I painted him as a portrait. 
And here I painted him in expressionist style, the way he was attacked, the way he was injured. You see his gestures started to vanish. And here I painted the, the moment that he died. What I did, I asked one of my friends to bring that remains or the coals or, you know, the, ashes, the, the ashes, ashes, yes, exactly. The ashes of, the, of that car, the booby trapped car, that car, the bombed car from the location of the accident that happened and brought it to Amman. I was living in Amman, Jordan. From Baghdad to Amman, they sent that. That ashes was like a kind of charcoal. And I painted him with that, you know, mm -hmm. with, with, with the crime scene evidence, you know. The last painting is just a blank painting. He's not among us. He's in heaven, if I may say, say that. What I did, I asked my audience to touch the third painting and since it's painted with the ashes, their finger, like, you know, like in the museums or galleries, like the touching the painting is prohibited. You, you, you can't touch the art pieces. But here I'm asking my viewer, my crowd to touch the painting. After they touch it, they see that their hand, you know, they were like stain or that like prints on their hands. And I ask them to clean their hands here, to wipe their hands here. Clean it because it's dirty now, you know? Clean it here. And after they do this, there will be like fingerprints there. The fingerprint is the main evidence in the crime scene that you are the criminal. The first one who did this is me. I am also one of the people who are responsible to make peace on this globe. We have to create peace in this globe. I am telling the audience with more than thousands of fingerprints here that all of us are responsible to make peace here, to stop war on this world. This, this artwork, like it's a conceptual artwork, traveled a lot, like Switzerland, Cairo, Amman, Beirut, Dubai, New York, San Diego, everywhere. And the frames, are like, you know, the frames are like attacked a lot because, you know, the packaging. And I used to take this artwork with me in the plane, not in the checked in bag. And uh, they sometimes they accept to put it like next to me. I said, but this is like a human being next to me. This is not an artwork, you know. And this is how I exhibit them. This is the first exhibition. This wasn't a man. And if you see this piece now, it's almost gray or dark of like accumulated of the fingerprints. One of my major exhibitions was Letters Don't Burn. When I was studying and uh, like preparing for my, my master degree, we used to go to the library a lot to get references, books and everything. And when, the war ended in 2003. We went back to the campus and I went to the library. And I realized that the library was burned completely. Somebody, an anonymous enemy, broke into the library you know, and burned all, everything there. Everything like turned to be ashes. What I did, I collected these ashes. I think I have here another picture here. I collected these ashes from this book, from these books, and put them inside a cylinder. And I brought them here. And I also exhibited in New York and in many places. I am saying that our history is, our history and culture is through this book. The knowledge is through this book. If you want to destroy somebody, destroy his culture, and his knowledge, not kill him, just destroy his knowledge. And this is what our anonymous enemy did. You see, 
nothing like left. And you see like the ashes like different colors. I try to like create a composition like a dark gray, you know, with some poems of Mahmoud Darwish, Badr Shakar Sayyab, like great Iraqi poets. Then I took my message to New York. In New York, I created like I, uh, an exhibition piece on war. Here is the main painting of this exhibition as peace and war. The woman always is peace. And uh, you see here is this struggle, this fight between the good and bad is endless. And we're still living this at this very day. The fight is everywhere. Even we fight with ourselves. I am saying that if we are unable to establish peace at our own home, it's very hard to like to get a peace in our community, in our town, in our city, or in our like in our mother earth. This is another. This is another like uh, conceptual art. This is like uh, exhibited here on the ground of, uh, of the gallery, on the floor of the gallery. This is very huge. Through this art, the footprint, I wanted to say that all of us are competing each other. We want to get the best positions. We, don't, we want to get the best income. Uh, best authority, best power, everything. We are competing each other. You see here, I got footprint for military, civilian, women, men, barefoot, without shoes, animals, birds, all of us in this universe are fighting each other, even though we looks like we are peaceful but we fight each other in different way. That's why if you want to get a footprint for yourself, you have, you know, what you call it, like to exclude somebody, you know, to come here. If you want to be the manager, the director, you know, for an office, you have to exclude your director, you know. You have to work hard to do that. And this gives us an indication that is not easy to get that position. Do we need, do we need like, uh, do we need to fight each other to get good positions? I believe that in this globe, we have abundance of good things. We have treasures, which is enough for everybody. I don't know why, why you are fighting. There's everything, like everything is enough for all of us. Water resources, trees, oil, everything. There's enough, but we want to fight. We, we manufacture weapons to fight each other, to get everything for us, not for the others. And this is was very huge one. I also like exhibited this like in many, many different countries. And my audience, they try to find a footprint and it was impossible to find one because I designed this without fight, without like allowing anybody to find like a place for, for their <laughs> footprint. Art as a peaceful weapon. Here, this painting is one of uh, my new series called Black, White or Gray. This is a woman carrying her country over her head. And the lady who purchased this painting, she liked it very much based on, you know, the characters, but she didn't realize this is a nude man over her head. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I was saying this, the man is here like representing symbolically uh, her country and she's sacrificing to carry her country over her head, you know? And always I see the woman as a big sacrifier. And I, I hope I have this complete painting because this is just a detail of it. This is the project, black, white, or gray. I painted this in, in uh, the epidemic. 
like uh, the man, the origin, you know, with the flower of five leaves, which is indicate the luck. Also this one too. This is very, it's a very difficult technique to paint in like mono, mono color, monochrome. I, but I want to say that there is nothing absolute white or absolute black. All of us are living in tones and shades of gray. Even the man and the woman, when they fight at the house, like it's not necessary the woman is right and the man is, is, is wrong. Both of them are right. Both of them are wrong. You know? it's some, everything in our life is relative. Relativity is something we have to rely in to accept each other, to get a tolerance of each other. Acceptance is the major tool to live harmoniously with each other. I use a lot of symbols, horses, hoopin, the magic bird, the man who became owl. The story of this, these two paintings, I, I love to do, by the way, like yours, very large paintings. The paintings that you saw in Abraham, you know, they are too small based on the scale that I like, my favorite scale, my preferences like scale. I like to do huge, massive canvases. But Paul, Bishop Paul told me, no, we have to do it small, and <laughs> like more convenient for packing, you know. And I, I, I told him, okay, let, let's roll them. Let's do like roll them, but you know, like logistically, like when you roll a painting, you have to stretch them back, you know, to find stretching and you find a professional one to stretch them. I said, okay, let's make it small. <laughs> and he, he, they did a great job actually because they are more convenient to travel. These exiled one, I'm talking about our people and all the people in the world who were displaced from their places, their homes, and voluntarily. They were forced to leave their houses. They forced to leave their lands, to leave their businesses, and go out. Especially with ISIS, when ISIS like started to invade Mosul, a lot of Christian and also some like Shia people there, they left their homeland because the ISIS, the extremist fundamentalist people, wanted to get rid of all these minorities in Mosul. And here I, I'm showing a man carrying his wife and his family and tried to leave. But when he leaves his country, his country didn't leave him. He will carry his country with him. This big cube, part of it, geometrical shape. This is an indication to the, to the homeland, indication to the place, to his home, to his house. You see here, even like their furnitures, their belongings here, they want to stay, but they have to leave. This is very massive paintings. And I wanted through this, like I, I exhibited this in a, in a show I titled Encoded Histories. I wanted to say that everybody is traveling from point A to B. But the problem is, is he traveling voluntarily or is he he's forced to, to leave? You don't know the feeling if you are displaced aggressively when they when they threat your life to leave and when you want to leave you can't even take all your belongings with you it's very tough maybe you just like embrace your kids and run to save your life also these paintings the big ones it's about uh, the explosion that happened in uh, 
you see like, just I like, I focus on huge canvases. These, these lovers were interpretation of a poem of Al-Mutanabbi. Al-Mutanabbi Street was a very big exhibition in DC. This painting is here. We were protesting, criticizing this violent act happened here in Al-Mutanabbi. Al-Mutanabbi is very well known street where the booksellers are, bookshops, publishers, you know, the, it's a very cultural and very famous place to sell books. They exploded this street. Another step to destroy our knowledge, our culture, our history maybe. And this, this group exhibition was to protest this. We got more than four, 50 people in the crowd in the opening. American, Arab, and Iraqis participated in this show to protest against this act. I do video art as well. This, this video art like titled Traveler, I want to show you one of them. And here is the show of Letters Don't Burn. And this show I show installations, video art, paintings, and conceptual art, all in one major solo exhibition. I will show you like uh, footage of it. The fight between the evil and the good. short clip of this uh, of this uh, artwork. What I did after I finished recording and filming, I got this bookcase to the show. After I, after I burned the bookcase, I got it in the show and I made the cross section as a cuneiform letter, a Sumerian alphabet, the first Sumerian alphabet. And I put it inside the gallery and it was too huge. We have to like break the wall, uh, the door to get, you know, the bookcase inside. And it was very impressive. We painted all the walls of the gallery black. I got the small smoke maker, they call it, to give uh, an impression of this is happening right now. And this is another installation. As you see that I try to provoke and get the interaction, the audience with my art is called crude oil. I got here a crude oil, here in glass cube. The crude oil has a very severe, bad, annoying smell. And I put here this oil in one of the room of the gallery. As soon as the crowd step in, they smell a very bad smell. They have to do this. Oh, what is this? I said, this is what you are avoiding is the main source of the problem on earth is a crude oil. <laughs> this is a crude oil. And I put some of my drawings here, you know? And they told me why you are bringing the crude oil here. I said, when they discovered oil in my country, the problem started in my country. Everybody want the oil, you know? Meanwhile, the oil is enough for everybody. 
And it was, you know, it, it was good interaction of the audience. And uh, I try to cover this sometimes because, you know, the smell was, <laughs> the door was too much. And this is another artwork. Uh, remembering, uh, you know, Holako, Tamor Lang, the guy who destroyed the libraries in Baghdad in 1258. Holako, right? Tamor Lang. They invaded Baghdad, uh, one, like in the, the 13th century. And what he did, he collected all the books and he threw them in the Tigris River. The Tigris River tend to be blue and black because of the ink, the manuscripts mm -hmm. of the books. What I did, I was an Amman too, Jordan. I got like a few gallons from Tigris River water. I put them here in this tank and put some real books inside. And I got also like some real manuscripts to get the water to be blue and black. And the people I was showing, like a sample of what happened at that time, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, to touch the sense of the audience to see what happened 800 years ago and what happened a few years ago, too, you know, the same is the same tragedy, no, it's tragedy. Here's the Tigris River in Baghdad. And this is the artwork. We call it an installation. Now, Abraham. Abraham is the one of the, we talked about this yesterday a lot. Abraham is one of the exhibition that I enjoyed participating with, with um, Bishop Paul. Um, is one of the major like shows that I participated, even like small, five small pieces, but I enjoyed it very, very much. I enjoyed the idea. I enjoyed the concept. Especially Abraham is from this city, Ur. The Zakurat of Ur is a place in north, located in, uh, sorry, south of Iraq, 200 kilometers south of Iraq. Let me show, show you where is it. Let me show you where is it before I go here. <laughs> here. This is, you know, this is Arabian Gulf, Red Sea, Med Mediterranean Gulf, uh, uh, sea here. Now we need a few seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And here is Iraq, you see? Now, here's Baghdad, here is Nasiriyah. Yeah. Or Nasiriyah, which is, called Ur at that time, and, and they are still calling it Ur. But the governor, the big city called Nasiriyah, I got from Google, Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Zechariah of Ur. Yeah, this is one of the Sumerian and Akkadian and Chaldean temples. They build the temple in this way because they want to be closer to the divine closer to their God, you know? And that's why they make it like layers and layers as much as they want, like a Tower of Babylon, if you remember that. Let's go back to how I started this project. I started to do a lot of sketches. I have around like 20 sketches of this project. And then I translated the sketches to artworks like this, you know? Here, for, for instance, this painting specifically, I'm not showing the face of Abraham because Abraham may represent everybody of us. He's sacrificing his son. Each one of us has his own sacrifice in his life. Sometimes we know about his sacrifice. Sometimes you don't know. Even the close friends, close family, they don't know about our sacrifice. Everybody has his own sacrifice. But he, here, he's making... He's attempting to do one of the very big sacrifice in his life. He wants to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. That's why I painted the palm tree 
which is a symbol of Iraq, not south of Iraq, is very short, based on his sacrifice, you know? And his long beard to show the sorrow that he was suffering at that time, but he has to obey, obey God. You see, it's something different, like between the sketch and the painting. Maybe the sketch also to represent a lot of, you know, the bloody death happening in my country or happening in a lot of like places all over the world. <laughs> Here's the, another painting you see when Abraham is embracing three kids represent the three monotheistic faith, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. All of them, you don't, maybe this is Islam, maybe this is, I don't know. Just to give an example that all of us are one. And I, as I mentioned yesterday, I got this piece of garment, cloth, material. I paste it here from the place that I show you, the Google world. I ask of one of my friends to go to look for a shepherd to ask him to give his cloak. It was not easy to find a shepherd in the desert. I told him, don't call anybody. Don't go knock on the doors, like looking for a shepherd. Just go to the desert. He said, how I go to the desert? Am I going to ride a camel? I told him, no, no, no. Go to the desert, okay? Get your water with you. Make like hiking. Go hiking in the desert. Look for a shepherd. I told him, you have to Follow my instructions 100%. Please don't go to the, to the shepherd's house. I know that you may know many of them there. Don't make on the door, hey, I want your cloud. No, no, no. Go to the desert. See him during his job while he's taking care of his cattle and sheep and goats. And then ask him, I want your uh, cloud. Don't give him money. Just ask him, I want your cloud. If he gives give it to you, great. If not, go find another one. And yeah, and I was lucky and he was lucky. The first one he met, uh, an older man is like end of his 70s. Right away, he took off his cloak and gave it to him. And he didn't ask him why, what are you going to do with it? Just gave it, gave it to him. And I got this cloak from Nasiriyah to Baghdad to Amman and other cities until I got it in San Diego. Of course, I compensated that shepherd very well because he was very generous with me. I had to be very generous with him. I got his cloak, I cut a few pieces, and I pasted it here, you know, on the canvas to, to give the originality, you know, to give the sense, the odor, the smell of that land. You see? And that land is represented here by the cube that I painted here. This is also like visiting the the three visitors, that we accept the visitors, whoever they are. And this is the place that I told you about. And uh, I feel that, like Abraham, since he is our father, all of us are, are, are his kids. All of us are his family, you know, because we are living under his tent, you know. And this way, we will be able to accept <coughs> our differences. We bridge our differences. When we bridge our differences, we will start to like each other, love each other. And if I love you, I will not fight you. I will not throw bricks on you. I will not smash your window, as the story of my friend, classmate, you know? I will love you. I protect you. <coughs> and I think this is one of the main purpose of humanity. That's why in my exhibitions, many of my audience attempt to smell <laughs> my paintings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Case. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I think we'll open it up for some questions. Would that be all right? And uh, any question I think is uh, goes, and I'm sure he doesn't mind controversial questions as well. So 
Any questions? Press. Chase, I'm just wondering. I'm wondering if you feel uh, alone in, in this kind of artwork for what you're doing, or do you have other friends who experience something similar to what you've been experiencing? And do you have a community of artists that you find are doing this? Or no, no, I, I, I don't feel alone. I have a lot of fellow artists, like uh, maybe like college classmates, maybe, you know, exhibition mates or joint exhibitions. I have a lot of friends, like they share the same concept, the same idea, the same purposes, the same message. Uh, but everybody has his own way to interpret or convert his ideas to the body of art, you know? Everybody has his own way. But I feel that sometimes I go a little bit like a further step to, to get my own translation to these ideas. We are living in a very fast era, you know, with an Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you know, it's very fast. Everything, you want to see all the stories of your friends, you want to see a lot of videos, a lot of reels, you know, it's very, the life is very fast. How come you can stop the crowd to watch the poor painting? You know, the painting is very poor right now. How? Because the people are thrown with these images, a lot of images. We are not living in 18th century where there was no any social media, no TVs, nothing, you know, no technology. This was their own, like maybe the only entertainment they, they have. Art, museums, paintings, whatever. Now the life is too fast, you know. It's barely you stop to see like maybe it's a video 30 seconds, you are not going to finish it. It's too, oh, 30 seconds is too, it's too long, you know? How you can tell your audience, stop, watch this. You have to provoke him. You have to stimulate his feeling. That's why I try to touch this part to, in order to get the message to be conveyed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I like the most painting. The painting, I like it more. I do installations, as you saw here. I do video art too, I enjoy it. I do conceptual art. Sometimes I do sculptures. But painting, this is my major and the way where I breathe, you know, smoothly. Thank you. And big canvases we learned as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Panama, and I felt like people here in the United States said, you know, be careful, you know, you're going to another country. But those people were so good to me, more than, and I was wondering, how do we get people, I feel like kind of like Americans don't know how to be that welcoming to other people. Mm -hmm. Have you felt welcomed here? And do you feel like we can... Do more? Yeah, it's also a stereotype. We talk, I like I talked about that yesterday. Um, first year I came here, it was 2008. It was five years after the invasion. And uh, I have something in my mind because you know, like when a country like uh, occupy your country, invaded it, you have that maybe bad reaction or like, you know, a fred reaction of that when you go there, but as soon as I came here, I find that the American are very nice people. In California, everybody like smiled, you know, when you see you like eye contact, they smile to each other, you know, they're very nice, very helpful, very understandable. They're literally very nice, very nice people. And you know, like the people is different than the government or the, the regime, you know? I don't want to take to talk about politics, but the people, are very nice. I love all I love all the people who I met in all my exhibitions. I love I got a lot of exhibitions here, you know, a lot of shows, a lot of talk. I love all the people. They are very nice. The diversity of the people, you know, the diversity of their their origin here is very nice, very interesting. I love them. I love you all. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. You said a question about uh, your art education in Iraq, correct? That's you, your fine art school. Yeah. Um, so the closest uh, kind of conundrum that I was taught in school by a lot of actually my fellow Jewish artists was uh, this idea of the no graven image uh, command and how that affected their ability to be artists within their family and not experience this kind of shaming that would go on. Um, and so, you know, when I was reading about it, it was a lot of our Jewish Americans, especially in New York, that were adapting uh, to this kind of clause um, by expressing themselves with abstract art and postmodern art because uh, suddenly they could paint people and it wasn't necessarily so obvious to you know their their counterparts, their family, their synagogue. Um, I was wondering if you experienced any of that among your peers when you were going to school in Iraq, if that was actually even a thing that people were still struggling with as far as portraiture goes, as far as figure painting goes, as far as I mean, you had talked about um, the statues being destroyed or as a kind of a target for this idea of not having a idol, you know, mm -hmm. but it all stems from um, kind of, and I, I imagine similar commandments between, you know, our three. <laughs> yeah. Stating not to make uh, uh, art that. Right. Necessarily is in the image of man, a graven image, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if that's a concept that you had to at all deal with or were watching other people deal with. So, yeah, for me, like the terror act didn't influence my art in that way. I didn't change my art based on what they see or what they want to like to save my life. I, I was able to do just abstract or maybe to do calligraphy. This is like Islamic art, mainly, like letters or these things, but this is not me. I don't want to cheat myself in doing this and cheat my audience. I want to do what I believe to do, you know? Because I know that my art, main purpose of my art is peace, you know? It's love. And also it's like brotherhood. All of us are one. The quality of the people, you know? I, 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 I won't go to do just abstract because this will make them happy. I just do whatever I want to do, you know, without controls, without boundaries, without limitation. Yeah. I kept doing what I believe to do. Thank you. But Case, you would say that the more conservative, uh, Jewish and Muslim particularly, mm -hmm. would not usually paint images in the same way, right? No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah. There are a lot of conservatives, yeah. like Muslims. When they paint, they paint based on the Islam dogma. Yeah. The Islam, they accept what we call it uh, organic painting. Yeah. Something like from plants, these things, you know, <laughs> details, ornaments, calligraphies, but not imaging the man. Yeah. This is something as forbidden based on their belief. Yeah. Yeah. Was that conservative? Yes, sure, sure. they do that, yeah. More fundamentalist. Yeah. A lot of Americans don't know that, and that's why I was asking. Mm. It's a full of surprise, though, because the grand imam of al-Azhar, which is the intellectual and the spiritual heart of Sunni Islam, which are the majority of Muslims around the world, and it's based in Cairo, one of his favorite artists is Sanan Hussein. Interesting, in this exhibition, which has a lot of imagery, right, in it. So... Uh, but no question among fundamentalism, both especially among Judaism and uh, Islam, you'll find that, you know. But like this particular Jewish artist in this exhibition is Orthodox, you know. So again, it throws you, right? Yeah, this is yeah. so interesting, yeah. Questions, any other questions, thoughts? This is for Case's first Wyoming experience, by the way. So. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to ask you, some of the paintings, I think there were, I, I call them distorted figures. I thought at one time that looked like a pig flying. And then, <laughs> okay, this, this is my, well, never. And then, then they had squatty people and their 
feet were crossed and whatever. This, I don't mean to be rude, but what were you thinking when you were paying this? <laughs> that was, was synonymous. That was synonymous. Oh, yeah, it's not excuse tasty. me. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, I still wanted a what So was the question it? is, what was synonymous? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw the painting uh -huh. to a collector, and she, it was like, like a cat, in it, you know, a lady with a cat and an abstract expression style. And she told me, what this cat represent? What are, what you want to say through this cat? I said, what do you think? She said something, you know, she write a synopsis of what you think. I said, absolutely. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> whatever she, whatever she, her response is, I would say correct. You know, because I believe the paintings are like mirrors to us. Yeah. You don't need exactly to know my story. You you want to see your story through my art. My painting is a mirror. You know, I get I get tales, stories mm -hmm. here. I get these stories, convert them to art. You know, I give you some keys to understand. You know, the atmosphere or the outline of the art and then i leave the rest to you i leave the horizon open and then you get your story to see it through my art and then this way you will love it okay not necessarily that you love my story you are loving your story that you are seeing through my eyes as long as i get the right painter right <laughs> <laughs> but in those cross you know the cross yeah. feet and all of that he does mention in some of his statements what that represents for him so, um, yes. Yes, I really love that answer and that the thoughts that you just expressed there mm -hmm. to encourage us to meet ourselves, see the other side of ourselves, mm -hmm. to explore and imagine and wonder. I mean, that's yes. a great gift yeah, to wonder. Thank you. That's why one of my major solo exhibition was titled Reconciliation with Oneself. Because the big fight in our life is not with the others, it's with ourselves. We don't know what we want, you know? It's hard to go deep to touch the core of ourselves. And if you touch that and unify with yourself and you, you know what you want, then you will be creative. You will be very imaginative and very talented and very productive in what you can do. Thank you. Case, can you share a little bit about uh, Iraq used to be this model of tolerance and uh, diversity, Christian, yeah. Muslim, and Jews. You yeah. have many Jews, for example, in Iraq. Maybe share the about your grandfather. Yeah. Oh, oh that's uh, yeah, the old story. Yeah. <laughs> I forget that story too. I I, I told you like uh, Bishop Paul always awakening a lot of stories. I. I said this story in my first talk, right, in Scotland, right? I think so, in Scotland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My grandfather, uh, he was a merchant in a commercial area in Iraq. And his neighbors were Muslims, some Jewish, like very clever merchant Jewish, and himself, Christian. And when they, when they, they go to, the, to their job at 5 a.m., you know, to like export and import, you know, their goods. And when they have to get their breakfast, they eat in the same pan. My grandfather liked the eggs crumbled and the other people like his Muslim and his Jewish neighbor, they like the egg to be like sun side up. They sunny call, side up. Sunny right. side up, yeah. And, and they fight like all, all the time. I want it this way, I don't want it this, and, and, and I want it this way. And they end eating together. My my grand my grandfather, and this I got this story from my father, not from my grandfather. He told my father that how nice to eat from the same pan, you know. Now we have like my our own dishes, we don't touch, you know, the thing on the staff and silverware of each other, you know. They were eating by their normal hand at the same path. And I have an ima imagination when the three hands with three different faiths, eating 
from the eighth hand. The fourth hand is Abraham hand. Oh. It's coming like to eat with them. And this is like this small pan. You want to find this three faith, you know, how they love each other. And they used to live harmoniously very much, you know. They have fun. They like mock at each other like a very pure, good friends. Yeah, it was very like nice mm-hmm. story. Like because the Jewish in Iraq, that we, we had like a grand community there. And uh, their career was in merchant and uh, money exchange, I think, too. And, you know, after they were displaced, too, you know, sadly, from Iraq, like, I don't think they're, like, left, people left there, you know. And these were, like, we used to live, like, in harmony, like, with other faith in Iraq. But not now. Not now. Even we are the Christians, you know, we are vanishing because of this violence is happening. Yes. We have that same thing beginning to happen here. Our society is dividing more and more. We're focusing more and more on our differences, not our similarities, even within our own small communities. Okay. And I wondered if you had any suggestions on how we could um, stop that direction and turn towards each other more. I believe that differences is is building, is built based on something, right? Why there's a difference? It's built for something. I think that interest, the interest, you know, is the main purpose of this differences, you know? That's why we want to exclude the others. If we can get the purpose, the interest to be a collective one, if we can't share the same interest, I think I think we are not going to like you know to uh, enhance these differences. We will focus more on similarities. You know, the, I think the interest. You know, everything is uh, pragmatic. Mm-hmm. You know, function and the benefit. You know, it's interest. If we there's a an American philosopher. His name is John Dewey. He said, everything is pragmatic. When you do something, it's based on your function and your benefit or your interest. You know, we have to look at the background of that interest, which creates that differences that floating on the surface right now. The differences are there, but you recognize them and feel it. Feel that difference, feel that difference when it's floating on the surface. Yeah. Just look at the roots, I think. I think the roots is the, the major thing. If we can't cut these roots, there will be no differences. The other day we had a webinar where we brought the three artists together. And one was in East, uh, West Jerusalem, and Case was in San Diego, and Sinan was in Istanbul. And uh, one of the questions that I asked them at the end was, could you tell us something that you love about the other's work, looking kindly, you know, on the other. While I'm asking the question, Hamas is throwing rockets toward Jerusalem, and we hear the sirens going off as Shai is speaking. Of course, that's a reaction to what they're experiencing on the Israeli side, right? But uh, so it was a very beautiful moment where you had conflict in the back. Yeah, I was talking about you had these three you know, sharing how they loved each other in a very special way. So, That's a very dramatic way. Very dramatic way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've spent a few uh, years in Iraq, in the last 15 years or so, um, most recently in Baghdad in 2015. Um, do you have faith that the cultural vibrancy will return to Baghdad? Yes, I would love to, but since I you know I based here, it's hard to you know to go back. Maybe I go to, like for a visit or any artistic activities, but to go back to establish again is, is not easy. But because he, he wants to know if do you think the culture, the deep rich culture of, of Iraq, yeah, will come back. Oh, oh since there is good seeds, yes. Yeah, since there's a good seeds. Like in the Bible said, the seed has to die in the soil in order to get, you know, to be a tree. 
yes, there's a good seed because we have a very great ancient civilization. And this civilization is not just antiquities. I feel the civilization is a kind of genes that we are yeah, exactly in the heart. We are inherited, you know, from generation to generation to generation. And every time we fall, you know, we stand up again and rise again, like a phoenix, if I may say. And when we rise again, we, we maybe we start from zero again, but we are doing our part, you know. It's like a gene, you know. That's why, like, there are a lot of, like, artists in Iraq. Maybe they're my grand ancestors were artists. <laughs> we tell Case that if he grows his beard a little longer, he'll look like Nebuchadnezzar. Case, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you mentioned uh, you destroy a culture, destroy their books, which is a way of saying if you destroy all the memories yes. of the past, then you really have destroyed a culture. And if this culture is going to revive, there has to be ways of preserving a memory, a, a knowledge of the past and, the, and its values and its and its greatness, its distinctiveness, don't you think? Yes. And it is art one way in which that may be able to be preserved? This is like their way, they're trying to do this. Like when you destroy a library, you know, they are, you are destroying the source of knowledge. Right. But the library is object, you know. There is authors, writers, creators, you know, here. Right. And this is here what you can't destroy, you know. Here and here, you know. And with this knowledge, with this education you have, that you inherited from your parents and grandparents, grandfathers, you know, uh, you can write again, you know. You can. That's why in my movie, in my clip, the last 10 seconds of that clip, the girl here, the lady here, uh, she was writing the first two alphabet of Arabian alphabet, A, B, C, no? Alif, ba. She was writing that. That's when you are going to write the history again, even, even though that you are burning our library, we are re like reviving again. Thank you. Any other questions? I think on behalf of all of us, Case, thank you very much. Really, really gifted today. So thank, you. thank you very much. I Don't forget to visit the exhibition there at the Pioneer Museum. How long is it up?